So Pastor, he, he approached me several weeks ago about uh, speaking today. And, um, you know, a lot of times, given the uh, uh, pastor's a preacher, he's definitely a preacher. He's a man called of God. And uh, sometimes when I have to get up behind him, I, I somewhat feel a little bit intimidated. And when I say intimidated, you know, you want, I know the things that, uh, I know how he preaches. I know how he prepares to preach. I know the word that he delivers. And uh, he's a tough act to follow, you know. And uh, when he calls on me to speak or to do anything, I, I appreciate the, the, the confidence and as well as the, um, uh, the gifting that he uh, sees that God has placed on my life and allows me to exercise that gift. Preaching is one of the things that I, I probably don't do as, as frequently as I had anticipated being able to do, but I, I do appreciate the opportunity to, to preach and to, uh, um, to share the word of God. Uh, but it's always somewhat, uh, I'm somewhat, uh, what's the word, anxious uh, when I know that I'm having to stand before you and to share the word of God and believing that as I share the word of God, that I, I share something that is not just that I manifest or uh, conjure up, but it's something that is ordained of God. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great when God would confirms his word. And I believe he did that this morning for me. Uh, just in some of the comments that Sister Latrissa made uh, during praise and worship, uh, I feel gave me some uh, confirmation relative to the word that I believe the Lord has uh, given me to share with you today. And I do not purpose to be before you long. Uh, again, I say that all the time, and then I realize I'm up longer than what I anticipated to be. But I pray that our time here together today will be one that will be life-changing uh, and that we will leave here today knowing that we have been in the presence of the Lord and have heard from him this morning. So I, I solicit your prayers this morning that you would pray with us and pray for us that the Lord would have his way in this service today. Amen. So if you would, if you stand to your feet just for a moment, we're going to read a passage of scripture. In our reading today, I'm getting ready to read from the wrong place. Hold on just a minute. Okay. We're going to be coming from Matthew, the ninth chapter. We're going to start, actually, uh, I, didn't, I'm a, I think I told him I was going to start at the 36th verse, but I'm going to actually start at the 35th verse and read to the 38th verse. Okay. Again, Matthew, the ninth chapter verse 35 through 38. And it reads, And Jesus went about the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Let us pray. Father, your word is a lamp to our feet, a lamp to our pathway. David said, thy word have I hidden in my heart. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for your word today. Your word has power. Your word has authority. Your word has salvation. Hallelujah. Your word has deliverance. Your word has healing. There's power in your word. You said heaven and earth would pass away before one jot or tittle of your word would. 
And God, you watch over your word to perform it. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the written word. We thank you for the living word. The rhema word, the revelation of your word. Hallelujah. That quickens us, transforms us, makes us and shape us in the likeness of your dear son. Today, God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would anoint this, your servant today, to deliver your word. And I pray, Lord, that as your word goes forth, it would go forth with the power and with the anointing to change lives, to impact hearts, to renew minds and uplift spirits today. And challenge us, Lord, to do the things you've called and purposed for us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. As I was <clears throat> contemplating and praying and meditating and walking and singing and uh, trying to hear from God relative to what he would have me to share today, he placed on my heart this this passage of scripture. And there's something that just bore witness that this is what God would have me to share with you today coming from this passage of scripture today. And I'm going to just read it again one more time in your hearing just because I think you need to hear it again as we go into this message. Verse 35 says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel, of the kingdom and healing every sickness, every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then he said, then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And this was what I felt the Holy Spirit dropped in my spirit as I read that for a title for today's message. Help, won't it? Help, won't it? Anybody familiar with that statement? Anybody seen that here lately? Help, won't it? I don't care where you go, what type of establishment, what type of business it is. It seems like everybody's looking for some help, looking for some laborers. And it doesn't seem like there's anybody looking for any work. Funny, isn't it? Seems like in times past, there have been people who needed jobs and needed work, but couldn't find anybody that was hiring anybody. Couldn't find an opportunity to do any kind of work. Matter of fact, there was a season only a few years ago, at least at where I worked, the establishment that I worked in, you couldn't even get a full-time job. You might be able to get a temporary job, but if you got a temporary job, that means you had no benefits. You were working, you received a salary, you weren't even guaranteed the hours that you were working. Matter of fact, when everybody else was off on vacation or with a holiday, you didn't have vacation, nor did you have the opportunity to get the benefit of a holiday pay because you wasn't fully employed at that establishment, or at least where I worked at. So there was a period of time where there weren't as many jobs and what jobs were available weren't full-time jobs. But now we're finding ourselves coming out of this pandemic that there's uh, plenty of demand, plenty of opportunities. Factories are trying to gear back up, trying to get online and get things going, but they don't have the laborers to do the work. So we see that there is the demand, 
but few people to supply the demand. I know how painful that can be, being in a role of supervisory position, seeing a time in my business where orders are out the roof, where we have more demand than I've ever experienced in most every area of business that we, uh, our market that we sell into, I see that we have much demand. But we can't supply the demand because we're limited with resources and even the products that we need from suppliers. They don't have the ability to manufacture the products as quickly as we would need to, them to. In some cases, we've seen lead times that would, could be four to six weeks now they're quoting 26, 36, and sometimes even two years before they can get parts to you. Now, how long can people wait on their product? So we find ourselves in the, in the dilemma where there's demand, where there's a need, but no, not the resources to, to get it. Even, even challenging, just to share just a little bit more with you, when, when, the, when the product is being shipped to us, the people, the carriers are supposed to get it to us because they're lacking resources, can't even get it to us. Many times because they don't have the resources to, to manage the, the, the influx of products coming into their, into their uh, distribution centers and people that we're ordering from, they don't have the resources that what used to take maybe three to five days is now taking weeks. And in some cases, because they're short on resources, they're losing, even losing our product. So we're going months behind. So what a dilemma. What a dilemma to be in. And here in this passage of scripture, when I read it, I was taken by Jesus' comment when he said unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye there for the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers unto, unto his harvest, unto his harvest. To me, that was very challenging when I read that. This is 2,000 years ago that God, Jesus Christ, when he was walking here on earth, saw that there was a, a world that needed to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He knew that he had a message, that he was the message, that he had something that the world needed, and that was redemption. And that that message needed to be communicated and conveyed to a dying world that was dark and lost. Matter of fact, it said he, uh, he saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion on them. Many times now, as we live today and we see all the things, I mean, you, you see all the things that are going on, all the, the negative things that are going on, all the evil things that are going on, all the things that challenges us. We see, it seems like the devil's just wreaking havoc. It appears that he is. It looks like he's at liberty to do whatever he wants to do. And many times our thought pattern would be, that God is getting ready to bring judgment on this world, and he is. But also, I believe that when God looks, oh, Jesus, when he looks at the world, it's not with condemnation or judgment. It's with compassion. Because Jesus, not that he doesn't see what goes, is going on, but he sees that there's a harvest he sees that there's an opportunity. He sees that there's a, something that needs to be communicated to a world that is lost and blind. He understands that there's a message that needs to be conveyed to them so that they will see him and walk in a different perspective than what they're walking in now. Are you with me? So as it were, it looked like Jesus saw that there was a dilemma. I've got a message. I've got something I want to share with the world. There's things that I'm doing and demonstrating and modeling, but I've got to go away. I'm not going to stay here. I've got to go back to the Father, but as I go back to the Father, I've got to be able to equip some folks 
to do what I'm doing and to continue on what I've started. I need them to be the light and the salt in the world. So Jesus went around and 12, chose 12 men to follow him that he could disciple and that he could teach and that he could impart and that he could equip so that when he went away, he would have someone to convey that message. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. I'm going to go to Matthew 28. Starting with verse 17. This is something we've been talking about in our discipleship class. This is when Jesus is getting ready to, to depart and go back to the Father. Take his rightful place on the right hand of the Father. He's, he's been to the cross. He's, he's been beaten. He's been whipped. He's been crucified. Now he's resurrected with power and glory. And he, he leaves his instructions not only to them but to us. And he says to us and to them, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power. I need y'all to say that, all power. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Say it again, all power. He says, go, G-O, go, ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So Jesus, in the previous passage of Scripture, he talked about the harvest being white, ready for harvest, but the laborers are few. And he told the disciples, pray that the Lord of the harvest. Now, who is the Lord of the harvest? Think about that now. Pray ye that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into the vineyard. Who are the laborers? Who are the people that God is looking to to carry out the work of harvesting? of going out to a harvest that's ripe. It's not that it's not ready. It's ripe, he says. Are you getting that? The harvest is ripe, ready, but the laborers are few. And then before he leaves this earth, after spending three years with the disciples, discipling them and teaching them and challenging them, he goes away and he tells them, he says, all power, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Well, when he says all power is given unto him, he just didn't take that and go away with it, but he left power here for us. Matter of fact, we talk about this being Pentecost Sunday. Matter of fact, before he left, he said, I want you to go and I want you to tarry and wait on the promise. Because in order for you to fulfill what I've called you to do, while I know you're willing to do it, you're not able to do it on your own. I got to give you some help. And I'm not going to be here to walk alongside of you, but I'm going to send someone who's going to come along beside of you. Matter of fact, he's not going to come along beside of you. He's going to be in you. In you. In you. <laughs> in me? Yes. In you. To empower you. To equip you to lead you, to guide you. That's what Jesus said he was going to do. He saw that there was a need. He saw a harvest that was ready. But wouldn't you, if you would just go with me a little bit this morning, what if what happened in this community, in this county, and in this state of Virginia depended on Valley Harvest? Not the church down the street. Not the, 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 the church up the street or behind us. But what, would, what could happen or what would happen if what took place in our community depended on you and I? 
Would there be a help wanted sign outside of our church? Help needed? How would Jesus look at us today? Would he look at us as his hands and feet this morning? Would he look at us as a people that are ready to serve him? Not just by coming to church on Sunday morning and singing a few songs and listening to a message and then going back out and living life as if we hadn't had any encounter with him. How many of us have a vision for the world like Jesus had? Do we see a world that is ripe for the harvest? Do we see an opportunity for us to go out and tell somebody some good news where it is full of bad news? Or are we like parrots this morning? Are we parroting everything we hear that is negative, everything that is false, everything that would bring doubt, fear, and unbelief? Or are we parroting what Jesus would say? Do we have enough Jesus in us that we don't have to have a help wanted sign outside of the church of Valley Harvest? That we have believers in this church who are equipped, who are ready, armed, and dangerous. Not in your intellectual ability. The disciples were considered ignorant men. <laughs> they weren't learned people. They were commoners, but Jesus chose them. You know what qualifies you to be a worker in the vineyard of God? He qualifies you. John 15, 16 says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Listen to this. And ordained you that you should go. There's that word again. And bring forth fruit that your fruit should remain. Over the past seven, seven weeks, I've had the privilege and opportunity to uh, facilitate, I won't even say teach. I, I would say facilitate because the Holy Spirit is the teacher, but facilitate our, our disciple, disciples class, training, whatever you want to call it. And I've seen how me and others have struggled with what God has called us to do. Things that we know to do. Things that we would give mental scent to and say, yes, that's right. But when it comes down to doing it, we find ourselves being challenged. We find that there are things that are taking priority in our lives, that take priority in our lives. We find that there are things that we see that makes it difficult for us to do the things that would equip us and enable us to be who God has called us to be and able to go out equipped. And what I find is, and I'm saying this about myself, is that in order for us to be able to do what we're needing to do as the disciples, God has, has put forth what he requires of you and I in order to fulfill what he's called us to do. And part of the things that we've learned is memorization of scripture. And in the scriptures it says, Jesus says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. You don't need to bring a resume. <laughs> you don't need to bring, matter of fact, you can't bring anything to God other than yourself. What he wants for you and I, from you and I, is a surrendered life. He's got to have priority. He's got to have priority. He's got to have preeminence in our lives. How many of us come to church looking to see what God can do for us rather than us seeing what we can do for God? How many love to be blessed? How many love to walk in the favor of God? I do. But those blessings and that favor is conditional. And what is it conditioned on? Our obedience. 
our submission, our willingness to serve God. And God requires us to be fruitful. He desires and requires you and I to be fruitful, that we have fruitful lives, that things that we, that there's a manifestation of fruit in our lives. And what is that fruit? What is that fruit? What is really God's, with all the things that God would want to do for us and through us, what is the real primary thing that he would have us do as disciples? I just said it earlier. He said, go. Go and tell a dying world about the good news of Jesus Christ. Today, I would ask you, do we have a help wanted sign outside of our church or do we have a church that is full of ready, abled, body, body, Bible believing, uh, faith talking children of God who are accomplishing the mission that God has given us? Are we found weighed in the balances and coming up lacking and needing? Today is an opportunity for you and I to examine ourselves and see if we're following the vision and the mission, not that Pastor Steve has set before us, but that, the, that Jesus has set before us, the author and the finisher of our faith. There are three types of people in the church. Quitters, campers, and clam, climbers. Three types of people. Quitters, Campers and climbers. Quitters. Those are the ones that come in, they have an experience, but then life happens. Things just don't go the way we want them to go. Challenges come. The cares of life come. And they just give up and quit. Matter of fact, they can stay in church, come and sit in church, but they've, they've long since signed off. They've long, they're not contributing. Matter of fact, they're just dead weight on the church. And then there are those that are campers. They've experienced God. They've seen God move and work in their lives and in other people's lives. But what happens they get complacent. They get to a place where they get comfortable and they don't want to go any higher. So they get comfortable and they get stagnant and they don't produce any fruit. It's like that tree that Jesus cursed, full of leaves in a season where there should have been fruit manifested. When Jesus went up to the tree and looked at it, I believe it was a fig tree. When he looked up at the tree and there was no fruit being manifested, what did he do? He cursed the tree. And the tree died at its roots. How many people are campers in the church? They got the job. They got the house. They got the car. They got the family. Now they're just going to sit back. You know, there are people who have worked in the church, worked hard and diligently, but they get a place in their spiritual walk where they say, you know, it's time for me to get at ease. I've done all I want to do. Now it's time for me just to enjoy life and wait on Jesus. Y'all carry on now. Y'all carry on. I done done my part. Have you seen people like that? Those are campers. Yeah, they were zealous. They did the things that they, I mean, they were hot for God. But then they got to a place in life where they had accomplished all that they think they needed to accomplish. And then they said, it's time for me just to sit back. God wants me to enjoy my life. And he does. But he didn't tell us to go sit down. Matter of fact, he said, occupy till I come. Matter of fact, he said, when I come back, will I find anybody faithful? Anybody continue to do what I've called them to do? And then there's the climbers. There are those that say there are higher heights and there's deeper depths. There are greater things that God wants to do for me and through me. Matter of fact, greater is he that is in, the in me than he that is in the world. 
climbers are people that see that there's, there's a place we're pressing toward the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. Climbers are just not churchgoers. Climbers are just not people who are just active in the church. Climbers are ch world changers. In the discipleship class, and those of y'all in the class, y'all might be getting a repeat of this, okay? Jesus said something about abiding in him and him abiding in us. Abiding in him and him abiding in us. Well, we can't abide, he can't abide in us until we abide in him. Matter of fact, there's just no way. So we've got to be in the word. I'm challenged by that. Not in the word enough. But how are we going to know when God speaks? How, are we going to, how is God going to be able to speak to us? Unless it's through his word. Yeah, he comes, he uses the preacher. He uses the pastor. But you know, there's some time that you and I ought to spend with God alone. How many of us who are working in the vineyard, working for the master, how many of us are spending time with God? On the day of Pentecost, it said they were in one place, in one accord. Hear me again. He said that they were in one place, in one accord. Meaning that the reason that they were together is because he had instructed them to be there. So they were all following the instructions of Jesus. And he said, I want you to wait. And they didn't understand fully what God was talking about or what Jesus was talking about. They just did what he said. Has Jesus or the Lord ever spoke to you about something you didn't really understand what he was saying? He just told you to do something. And how many of us are hindered because we're trying to figure out why? instead of just doing what he said do, just being obedient. But those boys, and understand, Jesus had to deal with some people that were, those 12 were, were doubting, unbelieving. I mean, even up to the time uh, he left, before Jesus left, he, the, the, the scripture says he had to upbraid them, he had to chastise them for their unbelief and for their doubt. After all he had told them, but he continued to speak into them, pouring, and he said, go, you need some power, boys. If you're going to do what I, what I want you to do, he said, you're going to have to go, and I want you to tarry and wait on me. And they did that. They followed the instructions that God, that Jesus had given them, and they went and tarried. And on that day of Pentecost, the power fell. Understand that if you and I were really spending the time that we needed to with God, we wouldn't get so many different directions. Don't you think God could speak to us all and that we would get a concise, unified, cohesive message and that you wouldn't be saying God said one thing and I'd be saying God said another thing and I'd be saying God said go over here and you'd be saying God go over there. Wouldn't you think that God is big enough and powerful enough that he could get us all on one accord and that we would hear his voice? And that we wouldn't have to lean to our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him and let him direct our paths? Don't you think that we would be more effective in our discipleship in who we are called to be as a church and as a ministry? Not saying that we're not doing good things, but that God wants to take us to a, another level in our experience with him and what we experience through him and in him. And it's not all about us, but it's about the kingdom. Do we really understand what the kingdom is? Do, we, do you realize that there are people who are a part of the kingdom that God has intentionally, uh, has, has every purpose and intention for them to be a part of the kingdom, but the reason that they're not is because you and I are not doing what we need to do to bring them into the kingdom? Help, won't it? Help, won't it? Harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into the harvest. Quitters, campers, climbers. 
It's my desire that you and I be climbers. That we not have a maintenance culture, but that we have a kingdom culture as a church and as a ministry. That we'll be found doing the will of God and acting on the word of God and speaking the word of God. And manifesting the word of God. And you know, one thing about Jesus and with the disciples as they carried out, not only did the word come, the word came, and we talk about the word, but the Bible says that signs and wonders follows the word. Did you hear me? Signs and wonders follows the word. If the word of God is in you and the word of God is in me, if I'm abiding in the word and the word is abiding in me, there ought to be some signs and wonders that follow. We shouldn't, like, we shouldn't settle for anything less than God's best when it comes to what his word says he will do. So my, 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 my word to you today or my challenge to you today or God's challenge to you today, better said, is can you be found working in God's vineyard. Can you be found working in God's vineyard? And many of us would say a lot of things that we are doing relative to working in God's vineyard, and I would say, yes, that is all part of our spiritual walk and our experience. But when it comes to being reproductive, are we reproductive? Meaning, are we making other disciples? Really, Jesus makes disciples. We just bring the message. We bring the message. We share the message. We tell about the saving grace. We tell about the power of God. We tell people about Calvary, what it means, how we've experienced what happened on Calvary, how it's changed our lives, how it's transformed our lives. When people see you and see me, do they see any difference in us? Sometimes I get a little frustrated with myself. I'll just talk about me. Sometimes I get a little frustrated with myself because what I hear come out of me sometimes. Sometimes the words that come out of my mouth, sometimes there's words of doubt, words of fear, and even sometimes words of unbelief because many times my confession is not where it should be. But I thank God for the Holy Spirit. While I don't find that place to be pleasant, but I thank the Holy Spirit that he convicts me and challenges me when I find myself in that position that he doesn't want. The reason he does that is he wants to take me higher in my experience and what, I, what he does in me and through me and that I might be an effective witness Romans 12 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you and I present our bodies as living sacrifices, sacrifices holy and acceptable unto God, which is your and my reasonable service. And here's what he said. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Well, how does your mind get renewed? Through the word of God. I'm going to ask a question. How much time do you spend in the Word? We talk about the Word. Pastor preaches about the Word. We talk about the power of the Word. How much time do we spend in the Word? That's Only you can answer that, but I'm, I'm challenging you this morning. If we're going to go higher, if we're going to do the things that we want to see God, he said in the last days there's going to be an outpouring of his spirit. What, what's going to result from that? What's that going to be the result of? Disciples and believers doing what God has called us to do. That's what's going to cause the outpouring. It's not through osmosis. It's through action. It's through acting on God's word in faith. So how much time are you and I spending in the word? Only you can answer that. And then the next thing I would ask you is how much of the word is in you? You know, there's some people when they're like the Pharisees and Sadducees, they get, they can, they can, what scripture they know, they can ride that all day long. 
especially when they want to prove their point. They can ride that scripture all day long. You know what I'm saying? But pastor talks about the whole counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation, getting the whole counsel of God. And really the only time, the only way that we can really get the whole counsel of God is that we get in the word of God. But then the next question is, if you're in the word, how much of the word is in you? <laughs> You know, my daughter, I can talk about her because I'm up here and she's down there. She's on her daddy all the time, ain't she, Ray? Rough on me. Pastor talk about Sheila being Holy Spirit number two. I won't give you that qualification. But my daughter, she's on me. She's, you know, she's, she's into fitness and she's into working out and, you know, and uh, there, there for a season, you know, that scripture, you did run well, who did hinder you? Well, there was a season that she was coming into my house, 4 o'clock in the morning, 4.30. Get up out of the bed, Daddy. We're going to work out. Spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. Matter of fact, one morning I overslept, and she come peeping her head into the bedroom. You getting up? And she's still on me. She don't let up. That's where the Holy Spirit is with us. She, she likes Joyce Myers. And I tell her there's three J's in my life. Joyce, Jackie, and Jesus. The three J's. Because if she can't get her point over, she tells me what Joyce says, Daddy. <laughs> when she wants to get real spiritual with me. What Joyce says, I said, well, who am I supposed to listen to? You, Joyce, or Jesus? <laughs> Well, he's speaking through to both of us to talk to you. <laughs> By the mouth of two or three witnesses, or she gets really holy when she wants to be. <laughs> Valley Harvest is not a church with a help wanted sign. Valley Harvest is a church where the word of God has preeminence. Valley Harvest is a church where the people of God hear the word of God and respond to the word of God with an eternal yes. Valley Harvest is a place where, not where people can come and find out who Jesus is, but a church where the people go out and tell people about who Jesus is. Valley Harvest is a church of people who are connected to the vine who bring forth much fruit. Valley Harvest is a church that is like the early church when Jesus said that these signs shall follow them that believe they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Valley Harvest is a church where it says where people are oppressed by demonic powers that we go in the power and authority of God's word and the power of the Holy Spirit and we cast out demons and devils that have people oppressed. Valley Harvest is a church where the atmosphere is so filled with God that when people enter the church, they come into an atmosphere and a dimension unlike any they've ever been in before. Valley Harvest is a church with People who have decided to sell out to Jesus. Valley Harvest is a church that says, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. God's Valley Harvest is a church when old Goliath would stand out there and defy the people of God. That we would look at the devil and say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who would dare defy the people of God? Valley Harvest is a church that when we walk into Cole Morgan, when we walk into Volvo, when we walk into Wade's, or Wade's is closed now, Walmart, we didn't shut it down. When we walk in there, 
We bring the presence of God. Valley Harvest is a church full of people who are bold about the God they serve. Valley Harvest is a church that is filled with the love of God. I mean, filled with the love of God. The the nastiest, low-downest, ugliest person that you would come encounter with, have an encounter with, when they bump into you, you know what comes out of you? Is the love of God. That's the kind of church. We're not a social club. We're not the Kiwanis, the Ruritans to come together and fellowship and have a good time and do a few good things. We're sold out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Valley Harvest is a church where you don't come and get therapy. You come and get delivered. (laughs) You know, some churches, and don't, don't get me wrong, sometimes we go through things, we need counseling, but at the end of the day, we need to be set free. There are things that people not need to learn how to live with, learn to live without it. Huh? How many of you here today feel like, as a believer, I've got to live with this? And God is saying, no, 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 no. Uh-uh. You don't have to live with that. I'm here to deliver you. Well, if you're a quitter or a camper, you're not going to press to the point where you get delivered. You'll just settle. you either give up or just settle. Okay, sera, sera, what will be will be. But if you're a climber, you'll say, greater is he that is in me than he's in the world. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. That means it belongs to me. I told you this story before. I looked at Jackie one day and I said, Jackie, if I win a million dollars, would you be happy? Yeah, I'd be happy. I said, why would you be happy? I'm the one that won a million dollars. And she looked at me and she said, but you're my daddy. Now there's an expectation there. That if daddy has it, and she lives it out, if daddy has it, I got it too. She walks in that every day. Just come to my house. Got Ray walking in it too. He's a disciple of Jackie's. Woo! But listen to this. Now that sounds funny. That's in the natural but we say we got a good daddy. We got an advocate like Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father when we don't even deserve it. He's sitting there as a lawyer, our attorney, and interceding for us. Woo! Glory to God. Now, if Jack didn't have that much faith in me, and I'm nothing, why can't we have that kind of faith in God? Talk to me now. If God is as big as we act like he is and talk like he is, why is it that we're living beneath our privilege? Why is it that we're not having the, the, the victorious life that we should have? Why are we seeing God move and manifest himself in our lives and in the lives of others if we got such a big God and such a great God? Where is the problem? Is it with God or with us? We talk about it being the last days. We talk about how bad it is. We talk about what's going on. But it also says in the Bible, in the last days, there would be an outpouring. Listen to me. Outpouring of my spirit. Unlike any time, you think the day of Pentecost was such a great time, it was. But he said, unlike the day of Pentecost, there's gonna be an experience that's never been experienced before. 
There's going to be a manifestation of God and me, the Father, in you that's never been experienced before. And the only thing that's going to keep that from happening in your life and my life is us. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do with today's message? This thought came to me, and then I'm, I will look at my watch. I'm still within the time frame that Pastor Steve is. As long as I don't go over, I should be okay. What if God, now I'm not talking about what you've heard anywhere else. I'm talking about what you've heard in this church. What if God holds you accountable for every message preached in this church? How would you measure up? Think about the messages you heard. Not from me. Just think, I'm just saying, Pastor Steve, just the word of God that's been preached in this church relative to how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to, how we're supposed to act out as disciples, what we're supposed to do as believers. What if only thing God said, only thing I'm going to hold you accountable for, not necessarily what's from Genesis to Revelations, not that he would say that, but just what you've heard in messages in this church. How would you measure up? How would I measure up? Sober in thought, isn't it? So what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Valley Harvest is not going to be a ministry in a church with a help wanted sign on the outside. We see, we see the need. We, we know the vision. And we also know the mission. How are you going to respond? What excuses are you going to give God as to why you can't do what he's called you to do? What excuses could I give God that I can't do? Because he's told us that we have to forsake mother, father, sister, brother, children, whatever. He's got to have preeminence. Does he have preeminence in your life? And if he does, how would I know that? How would he know that? Because he says, we're known by our fruit. We're known by our fruit. So today, I want to urge you, challenge you, exhort you to come up a little higher in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you and challenge you to be about your father's business. I want to challenge you and encourage you that the harvest is plenteous. It's ripe, but the laborers are few. Can God count on you and I to get out of our comfort zone, to quit being so busy, to allowing the devil to put situations and circumstances in our lives that would keep us to be keep us from being focused on him. Matter of fact, this is what God said in his word. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. Because he's a good daddy. He's a faithful daddy. Amen. Amen. If you're in this building today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm here to tell you that Jesus loves you. You know he loves you. You know he died for you. Today you have an opportunity to surrender. Throw up the white flag. The devil has given you and you've allowed all these excuses as to why 
you can't serve him. You don't feel worthy enough or you don't think you can do it. But Jesus nailed all those excuses to the cross. And what he said, just follow me. You got to be willing to follow me, to deny yourself, surrender your life. I've paid the price. I've paid the penalty for your sin. I've taken the, the, the beatings and the, the scourgings. I took everything that we required of you. I took upon myself that you could come boldly before God, the Father, and allow the blood of Jesus to apply, be applied to your life and stand before God Cleanse from all sin and unrighteousness. Doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means that you've yielded your life to him so that he has control. Today, I want to say to you, if you're here under the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I urge you, I challenge you this morning to give him the opportunity to come into your heart and life. Give him an opportunity to change your life and transform your life. You know who you are. You know that the Spirit of God is speaking to you right now. And you know that you need to make a decision. Today is your opportunity to make a decision to surrender your life to Jesus. He's tugging at your heart right now. You just got to make a decision. And if you make that decision, he will enable you to walk it out for his glory. But he's a gentleman. He knocks at the door, but you've got to open the door. Today, I want to invite you to a new life in Jesus Christ. If you're here today, I want to encourage you to let Jesus be not only the Savior of your life, but Lord of your life. With every eye head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to pray a prayer this morning for those of you that don't know Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We're going to pray a prayer and we're going to ask you to pray it with us. As we help you with this prayer, we want you to make this prayer your prayer. We're just coming alongside of you so that we can help you structure a prayer relative to you surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. But as you say these words, while you're repeating what's being said, make it your prayer. And as you make it your prayer, believe that what you pray for, as you believe on the name of Jesus Christ, as you accept what he did in your behalf and allow him to be Lord of your life, he becomes your Savior, he becomes your Lord, and you come from a life of darkness into a life of, of, of light. And you come out of a death sentence to hell to a life sentence to heaven. So help me, those of you that are believers, help us pray with those today who would want to surrender their lives to the Lord today. Father God, help me pray now. Father God, I come in the name of Jesus. And I acknowledge today that I'm a sinner and that I'm lost and that I need you. Today, I acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Today, I open my heart to you and I ask you to come into my life and forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness and make me your child. I'm sorry for all my sins, and I ask you to forgive me. Today I act in faith, and I believe what Jesus did in my behalf. And I accept him, not only as my Savior, but as my Lord. Take over my life. Take control of my life. I surrender myself to you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. Today, Lord, 
I make the decision to serve you. Help me, Lord, to walk it out to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, today you've been accepted into the kingdom of God. Can you put your hands together and give God praise for that today?